Hey friends, are you tired of traps that just don't click with your story? Or maybe you're wondering if you should even bother with them at all. My name is Timothy, and though some people do call me Tim, I am a professional dungeon master running over 300 games of Dungeons & Dragons a year. And today, we're here to talk traps, and how you can turn them into something more than just a flavorless roadblock or time waster at your table. Interested? Let's dig in. So today I'm going to talk about uh, a couple of different things. We're talking about the types of traps, their story purpose, their mechanical purpose, and narrative purpose, and finally a handful of tips on how to put them into use. Uh, I want to give a special thanks to a couple of our members of our community who put forth this topic. Uh, so thank you, Arch's friend and Brett Wilson. Uh, and if you want to have your questions answered by a professional dungeon master, then make sure you subscribe and drop a comment uh, in any of the various forums, but especially on those polls and questions that I put out to the community trying to find out what you need more help with. Let's get into it. So types of traps. Uh, frankly, there's a bunch of different types of traps and they all serve generally the same sorts of purposes, but we tend to separate and differentiate between them just a little bit. Uh, obviously we have the, the typical uh, mechanical traps and the magical traps, so pit traps and pressure plates and pitfalls, tripwires, uh, you know, falling ceilings, all the good stuff. Uh, we have magical traps like like glyphs of warding that have great codified rules or the magical doodads and teleportation traps that we come up with just on the fly or in our homebrew designs. Uh, we have puzzle traps that are kind of their own breed in that they require uh, a little bit of player ingenuity instead of just some in-game good choices, uh, which is not always the case for our other traps, uh, and they tend to be uh, a little more ephemeral and, uh, and, and just not quite as nitty gritty. Uh, perhaps not always as deadly either, and usually we don't punish people for finding ways to, to, to try it, uh, except in some way that just disincentivizes them to keep going. But that's, that's all kind of different. Uh, environmental hazards are not traps per se, but they can definitely be traps. Quicksand and a sinking floor are really no different uh, whether it's placed in a dungeon or outside on the trail, right? So environmental hazards uh, are often traps of a sort. Uh, we have also monster traps that are kind of not necessarily traps in most considerations, but the old trope of sneaking past a sleeping dragon or stealing something from a sleeping giant uh, are two examples of monster traps. But we also have things like gas spores where the wrong interaction with a monster can be kind of a trap in and of itself. Uh, so those are broadly the, the like kinds of traps that we have in Dungeons and & Dragons, and some of them are a load of fun, and we've had fun with them at our tables, but we don't always go into the like why we have fun with these traps, or why we're even still including them, because there's also a bunch of them that are just kind of the boring, go ahead and roll your perception check, and oh, you have a passive of 25, so you know that there's a trap here. Yeah, we, we get bogged down in the gameplay and don't necessarily uh, give the traps all the attention that they deserve, and that makes them lackluster at our tables and in play. So uh, first up, the story purposes of traps. So for one, it's uh, you know putting a trap somewhere uh, intentionally in, in a dungeon or even in the wilderness, if it is a trap that has been specifically laid by somebody, then it gives us story context as to uh, what is going on in any given space. Uh, if you go into the Tomb of Horrors, you know that the traps that you come across there are there trying to protect something. Uh, so 
you you kind of get a feel for who that somebody was and just how devious, malicious, or just downright mean they were. Uh, you know, you you get to set the tone of the game. I tell you what, the the paranoia and danger of running Tomb of Horrors is uh, definitely a solid set of themes. But sometimes it can set up themes of mystery or just underlying tension as players are just not sure what is quite right around the corner for their characters. Uh, it can act as tests and trials to determine who's worthy and can thus add to a story by, uh, you know, by fiat as these traps are there intended to be beaten but only by somebody who is capable of doing so, which is a great trope that is fun to play through for our characters, especially when they come to the end and are like, yeah, check us out, we are the, the guys, we did this, we got it done, right? It's, it's kind of fun. Uh, and they can uh, kind of reveal, like I said, some information about the, the, the character and the history of the place that you're in and of who you're looking for, uh, who, you, who created the traps. Uh, secondly, there's the, the mechanical purpose of traps, which is obviously to uh, reward uh, players uh, for their uh, attention, for their mechanical choices, for their creativity and problem solving. Uh, traps are, are intended to bring out those moments for our players so that their characters can experience traps in a way that's satisfying as gameplay. Uh, it encourages uh, interaction with the environment and it, it enhances engagement when every uh, little intense situations when every little thing could be a dangerous trap uh, your players are much more focused on what you're telling them is there and on the details that are involved because those details could be the difference between life and death uh, this is uh, an important aspect of traps that's often neglected or overlooked. Uh, it depletes party resources. A at its core, Dungeons and Dragons is a resource management game. If you are playing it right, and obviously there's tons of ways to play D&D right, but at its core, the, the way it's generally played and or generally designed, uh, the usage of your resources and seeing how far you can go and whether or not you can accomplish the story goal before you run out of resources and die is the core challenge of Dungeons and & Dragons. And traps are intended to whittle away piece by piece at those just like an encounter with monsters or a social encounter that requires uh, mystical aid in order to get past or some form of other cost. Every cost that you come across is a successful depletion and erosion of resources that makes Dungeons and Dragons what it is. When we try to remove those is when we get into danger. Uh, and it obviously rewards clever problem solving because uh, most of the time when we're designing a good trap at least, we want that trap to be uh, able to be interacted with by more than just the roll of a dice. This can be tough for players because they're not obviously a skilled thief or rogue and so interacting with the trap can be challenging. We need to make sure we're leaning on uh, the side of caution and that we are providing uh, assistance and help and uh, and being understanding to the player in the situation. But uh, ultimately, the more creative your players are in overcoming the traps, the more they're going to feel the zing of reward as their exploration and interest in the situation overcomes something far more than the mechanical choice that they made months ago when they decided to be trained in thieves tools or perception or investigation. Uh, while that does give some kind of a zing to your players, it's not usually going to be as strong as the moment when your player will always remember figuring out how to thwart your trap with a blanket that they happen to have on their inventory. Uh, traps also serve a narrative purpose. 
Uh, they add to our world building and our lore, which is part of the story in a lot of ways, but they also uh, help us to establish the value or the importance of whatever is beyond the trap and help us to uh, set pace and tone and, and, and speed and help us with narrating out the chunks of lore that we want to deliver to our players uh, so they can, they can provide a lot when they are used correctly. Uh, honestly, the, the trouble is that we just throw in a poison needle trap and we don't add any further detail than that. We don't think about what kind of poison that is, where it came from, uh, what the poison trap is protecting, and how it's normally bypassed, uh, and who was using it and why couple of those questions, even if you just asked two or three of those questions uh, about every trap that you put in there and tried to give an answer to that in the process of playing out the dice rolls and the uh, discovery of that trap, some of that information could be fed into it in order to elevate the trap and make it uh, a more memorable experience and a more useful one on more than just the resource drain uh, front. But uh, tips on using traps, because frankly, it is pretty common for people to lean on their passive perceptions to look at what's written in written modules and see, oh, if somebody can uh, pass a DC 15, then they know the trap is there. Uh, so you just tell whoever has a DC 15 uh, perception that there's a trap and you tell them what it is and how what it does. And then they say, can I use my thieves tools to un trap the trap and you say yes and they try and dice roll and it's done. Uh, boring much? Uh, I think so, personally. Uh, so, a couple of tips. Uh, first, passive perception it should not do anything more than hint that there is a trap. A good passive per uh, perception gives you the least amount of information that is designed to get your player interested in looking deeper. So that might be strange holes in the wall that uh, are noticed in amongst uh, the framework of, uh, of a bas relief. It might be a, uh, a strange clear patch on the ground. It might be a odd breeze coming from one side of the hallway. It might be a couple of scratch marks or a crack in the stone, uh, small hints that tell the player that they should look more closely. At that point, an active perception check can tell people uh, what is there. It, it tells them, helps them find the, the business end or the trigger point, uh, something that uh, tells them actively and truly, okay, there is a trap here. At that point, passive investigation might hint at what kind of result this trap is seeking, what kind of outcome it's going to do and or how it might work. But again, this should be the smallest hint that is designed to encourage your player to actively look deeper. At which point when they search and look deeper, they can learn a little bit perhaps about how it works, that the pit trap on the uh, the floor is just a simple thing with bars over the top and there's maybe a safe path around. They don't even need to disarm it. Or they might not find out that much information if they don't beat the DC by enough. You can vary the information given, but an active check should tell the player something useful and actionable that they can try to use. This is also a great time to give some information about who set the trap or what it's guarding. It's a great opportunity to drop in what uh, Mike Shea at Sly Flourish would call a secret or clue that he has 10 of on a sideline just to throw in at an appropriate moment. This is an appropriate moment for such a thing. Finally, it's okay to make traps that thieves tools can't defeat as long as they can be otherwise defeated. And this is the point where that final check comes in. Maybe it is as simple as scratching out a rune may, uh, using an arcana check. Maybe it is as simple as using your thieves tools to disarm the, uh, the, the mechanism that is going to fire the poison needle. But maybe it's not. 
Maybe the mechanisms can't be reached. Maybe the rune will explode if you get within a certain distance of it and there's nothing you can do from a distance without special tools or magic to overcome that because what kind of trap setter really intends to set a magical ward that people can just wander past, right? So it's okay to have those kinds of uh, indefeatable traps that your players can then use their ingenuity to bypass in another matter. Maybe a misty step to the other side where there's a means of deactivating the trap that the dungeon denizens had to have in order for the leader to be able to bring new blood into the cult chambers down below. There's there's got to be an option available. It doesn't have to be an easy option. It doesn't have to be fun to go through. And ultimately, there's possibly the chance that, you know, your barbarian will just rage and race down the hallway, tanking everything with his face and getting rid of the traps in the process. That's a valid method that drains resources and stays within the themes of the game. And your barbarian is going to feel actually pretty cool when he makes it to the end of the hallway alive. So that said, that's setting them in a, in a setting as it goes. But some of the things that we don't always do with traps include deciding who the trap was meant to keep out and then making sure that it would do that job. Uh, I personally really find it frustrating when an adventure puts a trap in that seems to have no thought as to who it's trying to stop. And so, Though the trap is in a powerful wizard's lair and it's trying to, perhaps, uh, it, it would seem logical that it's there to stop his associates from stealing things from his, uh, from his quarters, uh, the trap does 3d6 points of lightning damage and is just a minor inconvenience to anybody with any degree of skill. Uh, this is a dumb trap that doesn't make a ton of sense. Uh, a trap like that that did a minor amount of damage to inconvenience somebody because they weren't supposed to engage in warfare, but also made an enormous racket in order to draw every denizen of the tower from nearby, that would make sense in that place. A trap that's designed to just absolutely kill anybody who tries to take your precious item, well, then you need to decide who they thought that was uh, likely to come there. Were they planning on fifth level adventurers, heroes that were uh, of a local degree and were likely to come and interfere with their plots? Or are these guys so billy bad that they were expecting the best of the best? Your trap should be set to destroy just that person. Now, that does mean that sometimes your traps should be incredibly dangerous for the party to encounter, and sometimes they should be trivial. And both of those are very valid, but do need to be used with care and foreshadowing. Uh, I don't know if I uh, can ever say the words foreshadowing enough, but figuring out how to telegraph a powerful trap is a vital skill if you're going to include one in your game. Now, you don't need to telegraph everything to the point where anybody who is just randomly walking into the area can say, oh, that's a disintegration trap. That thing will that thing will blip, 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 kill us. Like we absolutely should not touch this trap or go over this. It's okay to be a little more subtle with that. If it is going to kill your players, you may want to lean more towards heavy-handed than when it's a trap that's going to simply mess somebody up, hurt them significantly, or be a minor inconvenience. Because if you don't let them know that there's their life is on the line and then they trigger this trap and lose their character, they can't look back and say, oh, yeah, I saw that sign there. I, I shouldn't have done that. That was on me. Instead, what they can say is, my DM killed me with this stupid trap that he didn't let me know in any way, shape, or form I was in any kind of danger. Admittedly, one of my favorite stories was a time when I engaged in some, shall we say, acrobatic combat back in third edition. Uh, 
sliding down a banister and attacking everybody with my ridiculous multi-class monstrosity that was possible back then. And at the end of my move, I narrated a nice tumbling somersault to land atop the dark altar of the evil uh, priest that we were opposing. And I promptly died horribly to the trap that was on the altar. Uh, I was a little salty about it because I had no idea that an altar would be trapped in such a fashion to where somebody touching it, except for the specific priest, would result in a single dice roll, save or die, for a character that in my personal situation was something like 15th or 16th level, and uh, I, could take a, I could take a beating. And I lost my character there with no foreshadowing and was a little bit frustrated. Now, looking back on it, I think it's hilarious because the darn character jumped on everything and it was my own fault in that regard that eventually it was going to catch up to me and get me killed. But you see where I'm coming from. Uh, so it's important that we telegraph the really nasty stuff as much as possible so that our players can at least have the opportunity to look back and say, okay, that's on me, that's not on the DM. Because if they start to think of you as being the antagonist in your stories, then your, situ your, your games are going to suffer. Meanwhile, uh, when, the when the trap does go off, something that I like to do to provide just a tiny bit of player agency and maybe throw a bone and or a penalty and engage people in the role play as best I can is something called the click method. And basically it's just that when the, tri the trap is triggered, uh, you announce the click, tell them the first hint of what's coming or what they just did that triggered the trap, and then find out what they think that they could do about it with what their first instinctive reaction is and maybe give them advantage or disadvantage on the saving throw depending on the choice they make or who knows they might completely avoid it altogether with the action that they come up about. That's honestly a much longer topic and it's probably worthy of a vision uh, of a <laughs> Uh, vision. It's probably worthy of a video all of its own. Uh, so if that's something that you're interested in, then, you know, let me know in the comments and I'll go a little bit deeper. Arch's friend and my good man, Brett, I hope that this video was useful to you and to anybody else who's watching. Thanks so much for joining me and happy adventuring.